the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me. How great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God.
just as we worship then let the lord through the power of the holy spirit speak to you and to share with you what's on his heart this morning and if you have a word or a, a scripture it's always good to hear the bible read you know i love just hearing the, the word of god spoken out but also if you've got a, a prophetic word that you'd like to bring and you feel god's prompting on your heart then please feel free to do that because we'd love to hear what god has got to say had um, some uh, encouragement to listen to God and um, to write down some of the things that he has actually said to us. And one of the things that God told me I had to do was to release my children into his care. And um, I was praying for them this morning on the way down. Um, and the mountain this morning was actually, it was covered in, in um, mist and, and rain and cloud. So you could hardly see in front of you. So of course the radio wasn't working very well. And then suddenly on the radio, this chap said, um, <clears throat> when you're praying for the prodigals, remember there's a storm raging for their minds. And that storm that's raging for their minds, we need the Holy Spirit to actually come and speak into their minds we need freedom for them and that made me then think about giving my children to the lord we love our children so much we want to do everything for them but there are some things we can't do we can't get them to heaven we can't heal their sins we can't make everything better but there is someone who can so for our prodigals, please, he's asking us to pray that as the um, storm and the, the fight for their minds rages on, and it is raging, we need to just draw the Lord into it and say, here they are, Lord, I give them to you. Let them hear your voice, not mine, not... Um, other Christians, you know, because a lot of the prodigals have been hurt. And it's not what, oh, I remember a Christian who did this. I, the church said that. But no, we want the Lord God to speak to them, not other people, just our mighty Heavenly Father. Yes, amen. So release your children and your loved ones into his care. Amen. The next song we're going to sing might help you with that because the Lord God Almighty reigns. And he reigns over your kids and he reigns over your family and he reigns over this town and he reigns over where you live and he reigns over the nation of Wales and he reigns over the UK. Listen, just because the world is a mess doesn't mean God's not still reigning. Amen? Come on. God reigns.
This is the word of God it says God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him this is real love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins God is asking you this morning to make sure that you're inside and not on the outside. God loves you more than you will ever know. But to experience that love, you have to receive it. You have to receive his forgiveness through Jesus. And receive the Holy Spirit into your life. And God the Father and God the Son will come to you in a way that you have never, ever experienced him before. Amen. Amen. Song and I want to give testimony to the goodness of God. I can honestly say that all my life, God has been faithful to me. Uh, I've never known a time that I didn't know God. And uh, last week, particularly, I was having a problem. Uh, for a couple of weeks, I'd had a problem with my hip, a problem with my back. I couldn't bend down to pick Esther up. I would, couldn't sleep because I couldn't lie on my side. And then it started to affect this one as well. So I asked, as we were at the communion table last week, if somebody would pray for me. And uh, three of the girls came and prayed for me. And since then, I've been fine. I can sleep, which is great. And I can bend down. I can do anything. I couldn't even, if I'm honest, bend my body to put my pants on because it, it was painful. But I am healed. God has done it. So thank you, Lord, for doing that for me. Um. Thank you, Andy, for confirming the word that the Lord gave me while I was sitting there and we were praising the Lord. And it's, um, what are you holding on to? The presence of the God, the presence of God is so evident here today. And we're praising him with our mouths and our hands. But we're about our hearts. What are you holding on to? that is preventing you from taking that step into the kingdom. That step, which is the step you need to take for eternal life, to get all the promises of God manifesting in your life, you have to take that step. And I don't know what it is, but God knows. It could be doubt, unbelief, unforgiveness. Some hearts are heavy, and sorrowful, give it to God, let it go, because he is all things, and he will give all things to his children whom he loves dearly. So if there's anyone here today, just open your hearts and listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you through his message this morning. Thank you.
This season, then we're in. We're in the season of autumn. We have, yeah, you know, meteorologically. I'll try saying that with a dry mouth. Uh, we are in the season of autumn, and uh, we're going to be starting a, a, the Romans course today. Uh, the Romans course is put together by the Bible Society, and you can follow all of the resources that we'll be using through the autumn, with a couple of breaks and a couple of, you know, special services, harvest, and one or two other things. And then we get to the beginning of December, and we're going to go into Advent. Um, so between now and sort of the, the end of November, we'll be looking at the book of Romans and we'll be following some of the outlines that the, this particular course puts together because we think it just is an amazing thing to do. And the Bible is God's word. So we are uh, going to be using uh, God's word. So can I suggest to you, okay, this is something to take away, um, that one day in this week, one day in this week that you do something amazing. You turn the TV off. I mean, anyone know where the remote is? Because in our house, it's on all the time. You know, from, from sort of half ten in the morning till about half nine at night. Okay? And um, there's, there's, no, there's no peace. There's no rest. So you need to turn the TV off. You need to make yourself a nice brew. Okay? Whatever your, whatever your, your poison is. And you need to sit down and you need to read the whole book of Romans. So 15 chapters should take you about an hour. Okay? I'm not asking you to do a full in-depth you know, study on the book of Romans. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you just to read it. I don't want you to skim read it either. You know, oh, oh, I know that bit. Oh, 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 I've read that before. Read it through. And let the word of God dwell richly in you. And it will do you good. It will, I mean, the word reading the Bible always does you good, doesn't it? <laughs> But um, you, you, you'll get a gist of what Paul, the author, is trying to tell the church in Rome. Okay? And if it's ever a valid and relevant word for us today, then we need to hear it. So we're going to listen, um, I, I hope, and you're going to read um, the book of Romans. That would be really good. We're going to try and dig a bit deeper and try and see where the author is heading. And maybe a kind of parallel will help you. So maybe as you look at Romans, this might help you. So um, one author has suggested that um, Romans is shaped around the story of Israel. So you can say chapters 1 to 3 unpack the themes of creation and Adam and the fall from Genesis chapter 1 to 3. You could say that Romans chapter 4 explores the call of Abraham. Romans 6 and 7 considers the exodus and the giving of the law. Romans 8 depicts the arrival in the promised land. And at a push, and this is my addition to this, not this author's, this is my addition to this, one could say that Paul's discussion about the Jews and the Gentiles in 9, 10, and 11 is a parallel to the exile. You know, they were, they left, the, the glory of God left them, they were kicked out of the promised land, they had no inheritance, no, oh, what's going to happen now? But God is faithful. 
See, God breaks in at that moment. God is faithful and says, listen, you might be over there in Babylon, but I'm going to bring you back. And you Jews over there, you might not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but there's going to come a point when you're all going to come in. Yes? You believe that? It's the, it's the Gentiles moment. It's our moment. This is our, that's why we have to grasp this salvation with all of our hands and with all of our hearts and with all of our souls because it's our time. But it's not going to be our time all the time. Because God will fulfill his word. Okay, nothing in there will be unfulfilled. Nothing. So God will bring his remnant in. God will bring his people back to himself. Jesus will be recognized as the Messiah. But watch out then, because maybe our time will end. Maybe our time will end. And there'll be no more salvation for the Gentiles, for us. Be careful. Be careful that you're already in. If you sat on the fence, don't sit on the fence because actually that's where you get splinters and it's really uncomfortable. Okay? Be in. <coughs> be safe. Be secure. Be in. And what was the cause of their exile? Well, why did God say, okay, no, I've had enough. I, I, I don't know if you read the Old Testament prophets. I hope you do. But, but God was so persevering with his people. God was, you know, why will you not repent? Why will you not listen? Why will you not turn back to me? And God got to the point where he was fed up with their disobedience. And I want to say this very carefully, you know, but disobedience drives God away from you and from me. When I'm disobedient, I have no way of understanding what God wants from me because it's a barrier between me and him. Disobedience wrecks relationships with God. <coughs> That's exactly what happened to the children of Israel. They disobeyed what God said. And so he left them. But fortunately, God is faithful and God is persevering and God is gracious and he never treats us as our sins deserve, does he? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So um, if you like those kind of parallels, well, you know, it's a bit like the narrative in Matthew's gospel, isn't it? You know, the five discourses of the five chunks of Jesus' teaching. Um, you know about all about that, the five books of the Torah in Jewish scripture, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They're the kind of, they're the kind of parallels in Matthew's gospel as he's writing to a Jewish church. So he, he kind of takes a, a kind of structure and he overlays it with story, as exactly as Paul has done here in Romans. So that's, that's the kind of thing we're trying, to, we're, we're trying to get to. As we explore this book then, of what the, uh, the Paul says to the early church in Rome, uh, let's just uh, bow our heads for a moment as we, uh, as we come to pray, as we hear God's word uh, to us. Lord Jesus, thank you for Paul's wonderful letter and all it has to teach us. Please be with us throughout this series as we explore the book of Romans. Open our eyes to the depth and the beauty of the gospel so that we may have a richer grasp of all you have done in the past and all you will continue to do in us today. Lord Help us not be ashamed, confused, or quiet about the gospel. Teach us through Romans so that we may be more confident in you and share our love for you more openly and more widely. Amen. So let me ask you a question this morning. If I came into your house and I said to you, how do you identify yourself? What would you say? Well, some people, of course, you go to a party, you know, and you're thrust into a room with people you hardly ever know and never see again. You know, how, do you, how do you break the ice? Well, you go in and you probably say, um, hi, I'm Andy, what do you do? Do we identify ourselves by the things that we do, the job that we have, or the profession that we undertake? Some people, conversely, some people, um, maybe if you're a pointless watcher, anyone here watch Pointless? 
No, I don't watch Pointless. Pointless is always on in our house before the news at six o'clock. Uh, pointless. Um, of course, they introduce pointless contestants, don't they, by saying, and this is so-and-so, and they live in wherever. This is Andy, and I'm from Cardiff. Yay! Well, I'm not really. I'm from Chester, but I was from Cardiff. But So is, is it where you live? Is it what you do? Is it um, who you follow on, on social media? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, it's, what, how do you identify yourself? So if you went up to somebody you didn't know, what would you say? Have you ever thought about that? Hi, I'm Andy. I'm a Christian. Amen. That's not the thing you say, is it? Because nobody ever says that. Well, maybe one or two people do. But, but you know, that's not the first thing that comes to mind, is it? Hi, I'm Andy, and I believe in Jesus. In a party full of people you've never met. It's not going to happen, is it? So what's our identity? Paul's identity, and we're going to read about that in just a moment, is, and it says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, an apostle called by God to preach the gospel. Paul, a servant. Now that word has been dumbed down. In the Greek, it's doulos. So, um, so Paul is a, is a slave. So I'm going to go and say, Keith, hi, I'm Andy. I'm a slave. Welcome. We all are. What kind of identity is that? You wouldn't go up to somebody and say, I'm a slave. Because you fundamentally ask the question, your identity asks the question, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? That's a question for you to ponder maybe over lunchtime today. Who am I? What makes me the person that I am right now today? What's important? Because not many people I know identify themselves as slaves. Some are slaves, obviously, because of the vile and evil practice of human trafficking. But to voluntarily identify as a slave seems rather odd. Paul, a slave. First three words of his letter to the church in Rome. Paul, a slave. Now maybe you've got to pick up the irony. Of course, here is this capital of the world where 30% of the people who lived in this city are all slaves and all want to be free. I think there's a wonderful irony we miss often in the Bible, isn't it? Um, and, and, and I think that's what Paul is addressing there. But to vol voluntarily identify as a slave seems somewhat odd. We'll come back to that a bit later, but because I want to say this, identity and who you are seems to me to be at the centre of political and educational and societal discourse at the moment. It's on the woke agenda. You can identify as anything you like. Yeah. You can identify... Um, I, who was I, t I was talking to somebody once. No, I won't go there. No, let's, I, I don't want to go there. That's, that's not really helpful. It fundamentally asks the question, who are you? Because that's what identity does. Who are you? So you might choose to be something that you're not. Is that dangerous? You see, God's perfect plan was to create a male and a female in his image. In his image. Do we get to choose? That's the fundamental question. Do we get to choose what God has made? Do we? Now, okay, I, I'm not going to answer that question because that is for you to answer in your own conscience. Do we get to choose what God has made? Because we might then determine if the answer is yes, I can choose to change what God has made. We might then get to the point, which is a logical projection, that God made a mistake. Does God make mistakes? No. But that, you get to that point, don't you? you there's, a, there's a logical progression. If I can change what God has made... 
because I choose to, then perhaps God made something not quite right about me. Hmm. I think that's a bit of a dangerous thing. You see, we know too, don't we, that the world we inhabit is a fallen world where human choices pollute the perfection of God and the perfection that God has created. And that is a truth that saddens us as Christians and reveals the pain in God's heart as he surveys his world. And in this huge and complex discussion, we have to be confident of our theology. We have to understand what we know, which is why we're afraid to engage with so many people who want to change the narrative because we are not confident with our theology. We don't know what we know. And even if we do know it, we don't quite know how to articulate it in a way that actually makes sense to somebody who's listening. Secondly, we need to be courageous in our conversation. We need to be able to say actually what we think is true and what we base that truth upon. Is it just your opinion that this is... Because actually anyone's opinion is anyone's truth, isn't it? That's not quite what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say is, it, what's the objective truth about what you're trying to convey to make people understand? And thirdly, we have to be compassionate in our understanding. We cannot simply browbeat people into believing what we believe simply because we believe it. I'm not in favour of that bashing people over the head with a big Bible until they give in. And they have to wear an anorak like me. No, that is not it. We have to be compassionate, understanding, gentle, loving, kind. See, we get so angry when things are not going our way. We look at the world right now and we see lots of things that are against us because we're Christians. And we get angry. And we lose the love and the compassion and the kindness of our God. Let's be careful with our words. Let's be careful with our souls. Let's be careful with what we spew out of our mouths, if I may use that horrible term. Because sometimes it can be really damaging. Sometimes we can say the wrong thing out of anger or frustration or disappointment. And it, it, once the words are out, you can't put them back. They're out there. So be careful. Please. Where was I? Oh, yeah. That, there we are. So back to Paul's identification as a slave then. He has changed from being the tormentor of the church to the teacher who shares the will and purposes of God with the church. He is now encouraging. What a, what a sea change. So let's read Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. We're going to get there eventually, reading the Bible. Here we go. Uh, Paul, a servant, and we've already seen that, uh, that um, slave, a doulos, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised, that is God promised, not Paul, the gospel that God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a phenomenal sentence. It is a phenomenal sentence. <laughs> exactly, I wish I could write like that, Trish, too. Through him, we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And this word is for us. And you also are called to, uh, among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Uh, to all in Rome, then, who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, as I said and uh, emphasized already, Paul calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ, literally a slave. Paul also shares that epithet with Jesus. Jesus made himself nothing, took on the nature of a slave. Slave, a doulos. 
Read the Greek. Jesus made himself nothing, took on the nature of a slave to serve everybody else. I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. <coughs> Jesus made him from the glory of heaven, from the glory of that Im Im incredible place. Jesus made himself a slave to us. A slave to us. Jesus, the Son of God, a slave so that we might have life. Um, it's don't you find it theology amazing? The significance of Paul's understanding of himself as a slave of Christ then is astounding and shows how deep the transformation of Paul's character has cut. Remember, we spoke about during the summer Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Paul, who Jackie was, wasn't it? Up on the balcony up there. Paul, with a big deep voice, Jackie. <laughs> Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Paul's life at that moment, that very moment, changed. From being an opponent of God to being a disciple of Jesus. At that very moment. And there is a moment in all our lives, just cast your mind back where you're sat, just cast your mind back to that moment when that moment took place in your life, when you came from being an object of the wrath of God to being in the family of God. That happened. If you're a Christian this morning, that happened for you because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. No one else made that possible, only him. But as I said already, how subversive that idea is to be a slave, where 30% of Roman citizens were slave and every slave wanted to be free. Paul doesn't want to be free. Paul wants to be a slave. I mean, how crazy is that? He, seems to, he doesn't seem to be resentful about the idea, and he proudly calls himself Christ's slave. I wonder what it is to be a slave in our culture today, then. Our culture largely subscribes to an idea of freedom that says freedom means the complete absence of restrictions. Is that your kind of freedom that you're looking for? I can do whatever I want. Nobody can tell me what to do because I'm free. Yeah, right. You're not free. You're subject to law. You're subject to common law. I'm free, so I can go about and murder anybody I fancy and I won't be imprisoned for it. That's, not, that's nonsense. That's rubbish. Just try and, try and think of the most bizarre thing that you could possibly do. Are you going to be free from the consequences of what you do? No. But here's Paul, a slave, who says, I'm free in Christ Jesus. Whoa, hang on a minute. What does that mean? Paul, you see, has a completely different understanding. For him, true freedom is found through submission to Jesus as the Lord of his life and devoting himself to the sharing of the gospel. Slavery, freedom, and devotion will be repeated themes as we journey through this book. I wonder this morning, quick question, could you and I share that identity with Paul and with Jesus? I am a slave of Christ. Are we surrendered, submissive and slavish in our desire to see God's kingdom flourish, the gospel shared, and our lives changed? The second part of this uh, talk, then, is uh, we're going to read Romans chapter 1, 11 to 17, if you just want to follow along. Uh, and it says this, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might be, have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated to both Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel." 
because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. In verse 1, then, Paul describes himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ, set apart for the gospel. And in verse 14, he says he's un under an obligation to the believers in Rome, both Jews and Gentiles. As one who has been entrusted with the gospel, he has an obligation to pass it on. Can I have that picture? That's it. See, there's your, your, your Amazon delivery man. We've all had those turn up at our door, haven't we? Eh? But what about the parcel he's carrying? Because he's legally, under contractual law, bound and obligated to take that parcel from the person that has given it. And he is obligated, under contractual law, to deliver it to the person to whom it's addressed. And so are we. And so are we. We have been given the gift of the gospel. We have heard it and responded to it. We have understood it. We've got hold of it. Now, some of us have got maybe more understanding than others, and that's perfectly okay. But if you know Jesus and you know the gospel this morning, you have been given an inheritance. You have been given a gift. You have been given this truth. And now Jesus says, go and deliver what I've given to you. Because I'm not ashamed of this parcel I'm carrying. I'm not ashamed to hold this thing with a big tick on it or a big arrow, whatever it is. That's what this man is saying. Oh, look, I'm stood there. Look, I'm, I'm proud. I've got the uniform on. You know, he's dressed like, a, like an Amazon delivery person. Woo! I work for the biggest company in the world. A lot of us are hiding a lot of us are hiding because we don't want to wear this and we don't want to carry it and we certainly don't want to give it away because somebody might not like us or somebody might reject us or somebody might um, say nasty words about us or something. But you know, we're under an obligation to the Lord to deliver this message. We are under this obligation. We cannot get away from it. Because for people like Marie, who find it so easy to talk to people about Jesus, and, 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 and I, I'm in awe, you know, because I don't find it easy to talk to people about Jesus. I don't. But she does. And I'm, I'm just so grateful she's part of our family here. But we all share an ob this obligation that Marie somehow gets out there what if that guy walked around with that parcel for the rest of the day and didn't deliver it to the person to whom it was addressed there'd be absolute ructions back at the amazon depot wouldn't there hey there would be he'd be fired probably you know like those postmen who throw, you know, you, we've heard about them, haven't we, at Christmas? You know, they've got so much post, they throw in letters in the bushes, you know. Have you heard about them? Yeah, well, I, I have. And so they don't deliver them to the people to whom they're addressed. What if we just chose not to? And that, my friends, is why the world is in such a state today. Come on. Because we have chosen not to. We have chosen not to. And that is such a shame. That breaks God's heart because we've chosen not to be obligated to share this gospel. But there's still time. <laughs> Isn't that good news? There's still time. So uh, uh, all of these promises that uh, uh, Jesus has made come to their fulfillment. And... Uh, he was revealed to be the son of God through his resurrection from the dead. Romans is not ultimately about some big and complicated theological ideas, but about a person. It's about Jesus. In him, all of the promises in scripture and longings of the human heart find all of their fulfillment. And this good news about Jesus 
is powerful to bring salvation to all people because if we go and carry out that obligation we will begin to see the world changed just where you are just where you are don't want you to go and change the whole situation in the middle east unless you've got of course you've got a calling to go there or the situation in russia uh, and or ukraine i'm not asking you to do that i'm asking you to change the world where you exist because of this obligation to the gospel Paul sees himself then as a slave of Christ under an obligation to share the gospel of which he is not ashamed. Would you describe yourself in the same way? Which bits of that description do you find most challenging? Time for reflection. Paul's desire to share the gospel with the church in Rome has been encouraged by God. We heard last week that God's purposes and plans for Paul were to go to Rome and God will not be thwarted, you remember? Even though he gets bitten on the hand by a snake and should die, God's plans will not be thwarted. Paul will go to Rome, the capital of the then world, and preach the gospel. What has God asked you to do in terms, in regard to the gospel? Are you responding? Have you yet to trust God enough to follow what he says? All of us are on that journey, aren't we? Maybe this morning, this morning you just need to know actually what the gospel means. What is this gospel? Well, the gospel is that Jesus is God. He died on a cross for our sins. He rose again so that death and the devil would not be able to enslave us. And he has offered us the opportunity of a new life. Like Paul's and many others devoted and surrendered to him and his ways. I wonder if that's what, something that you would be interested in today an opportunity of a new life a new becoming a new person that's what the bible says the old goes the new arrives when you put your faith in jesus christ so jesus is here to offer you this gift what will you do with it today i've gone out i've run out of time and i'm sorry for that i'm sorry i've gone over time today but there's such a lot in this first uh, 17 verses of Romans. I could have stood here another two or three hours, but I'll spare you that. So um, let's just bow our heads for a moment and just reflect on what you've heard this morning. Paul, a slave. Are you willing? Are you willing to be Jesus' slave today, used by him for his glory? Are you willing to take up this obligation of sharing the gospel? And are you ready to respond to the truth of the gospel this morning? Father, we thank you so much for all you're trying to teach us. We have to admit, Lord, that sometimes we're a bit thick because we don't get it. We're a bit slow because we don't understand. And sometimes, Lord, we have to admit that we don't want to. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. But as you've reminded us today, your gospel is the good news to the world for salvation. And so we pray we will take it with us wherever we go this week. And a blessing for you, all of you, from Romans 15, where it says this, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give us the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice we may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. 
From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God You are.